So I want to address acute and chronic uh, diarrhea. If it's acute, meaning it's happening right now and it's not a problem that happens over and over again, your goals are to reduce the immediate triggers, right? So if whether it's stress is a trigger or food triggers, try to reduce those triggers uh, to kill the pathogens if there's an organism creating it and to just reduce symptoms. So basically, acute problems reduce symptoms, get rid of triggers, and kill any little nasties that are creating the problem. If it's chronic, really your goal is just reducing the symptoms. And I would say for people like ourselves who think about long-term health, is seeing if you can find somebody for that person to help them with their long-term health problem. They might not have a name for it. They might say, I get diarrhea actually all the time and I'm stressed out and it does affect me, but I've never gone to a doctor. And you might say, where do you live? And they say, you know, this town. And you say, oh, actually, I know somebody in this town or give them resources. Very helpful here. I want to talk about treatments now uh, for diarrhea. One of the considerations in treatment with diarrhea is if you have an infection, and that's why you have diarrhea, you don't necessarily have to impede it right away. The reason that you have diarrhea is to clear the organism. So it's not immediately stop diarrhea. It might be immediately kill the organism, but diarrhea is not always an accident. Like stress-induced diarrhea, I don't know if there's anything positive from it, but actually infectious diarrhea, your first couple of stools, your watery stools, is just quick evacuation of food, quick evacuation of anything in your intestinal tract. You know, it's pretty hard with herbs anyway to stop that. But I just want to say that, you know, diarrhea, having it, it's not pleasant, but your body is trying to evacuate a problem. The same reason you have a runny nose initially, often with a, with a respiratory virus. One of, some of your considerations, if somebody has diarrhea, is helping to make them com comfortable. Comfortable, by the way, is not the easiest word for my native Long Island accent, which leaves out two or three of the middle words of comfortable. So, but comfortable. Um, if you're in a situation that you're not in a home, uh, try to help the person be close to a place where they can have bowel movements, meaning a toilet or an outhouse. So if you're at some event and somebody has diarrhea, they need to, urgency is often a part of it. So just help the person set it up. Even sometimes you get those portable toilets just so they can have, you know, if they're pooping five, six, seven, eight, nine times a day, uh, they're going to poop, right? It's urgent. It's going to be forceful. And just so setting it up, their circumstances. Not only so they're close to a toilet, and if nothing else, make sure they have hand sanitizer to rub their hands on with. Many times when people have diarrhea, they get tired and fatigued. And so it might, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to poop and clean themselves afterwards. The other thing you want to have, so I'm off for the moment about talking about vomiting and diarrhea, just diarrhea, is rehydration fluids. Water is good. Uh, but some of these basic rehydration fluids. But if they've just had a little bit of diarrhea, just water will work. Probably their body will replete as soon as they eat with foods. So foods. Uh, when you have diarrhea, initially try to abstain from any food. Initially, right, you're first having a lot of forceful, watery evacuations. Give your body a chance to just clear out everything. So initially, just abstain from solid foods. You can drink some fluids that might bring you energy, some fluids that have sugars. Even juices are a little tricky in here. But try to keep it simple. Try to make it as easy as possible for your digestive tract to clear out what's ever in there and to absorb anything that's positive, any kind of fluids that you're drinking in there. To jump to post-recovery or recovery, after the diarrhea, uh, your food choices are often really simple things. Blended foods work really good. In other words, the simpler the better. So you don't want to eat raw meat, for instance, or even raw vegetables right after you've had diarrhea. What you want are very easy to absorb foods. So one of the best foods right away is something like a miso soup or any kind of vegetable broth stock. So if you're going to cook the vegetables, strain them well. Now, at this initially, you know, so the diarrhea is gone, the person is feeling a little better, and they want to eat. First, just give fluids and juices. And then, if you make really good soups, uh, just strain them so there's nothing, there's actually no food in there, just lots of nutrients in there. And then next is mash it up. So, you know, overcook the food initially so that it's really easy in the GI tract. And then just slowly work towards, you know, more solid foods eventually. 
So I hope that makes sense. Basically, keeping it as simple as possible, slowly working to more complex foods. And everybody's really different, right? I mean, some people, you know, they can go right back to eating peanut butter and raw meat sandwiches. Uh, but most folks, it's much more coming on slowly. So that's the first part of the treatment. Ah, rehydrate, rehydrate, rehydrate. Diarrhea, fluids, diarrhea, fluids. Even if the person is exhausted and doesn't want to drink, they should probably drink, unless they're vomiting, which we'll come to in a little bit. So what I want to talk about now is, oh, I'm sorry. So one more, one more aspect. When, as they're recovering, uh, two really good foods, even before you give them those uh, soups that are strained, are oatmeal and slippery elm powder gruel. So as they're starting to eat, before you give them solid foods, consider just oatmeal, very easy on the GI tract and very demulcent and very soothing, or slippery elm gruel, which is just slippery elm powder stirred in water. Both of those are super simple. They're very sweet. The body can absorb some of the sugars from them, and they're demulcent, so they're, they're nice along the disrupted coating of your intestines. So next we're going to talk about the categories of therapeutics, like uh, the categories that you want to give folks who have diarrhea and then talk about specific herbs. So the first I want to cover are nervines. If the person has stress-induced diarrhea, one way to often know this is nobody else has it, right? There's no, it's not contagious. It's not a perfect way, and often they'll have had it before. You, you always, it's always a potential that somebody comes to you for the first time that they have a chronic health problem. So they, they don't have a chronic health problem now, it's just beginning, and you're the first person to see it, right? So they have stress-induced diarrhea, and actually their body's been working towards this. They're a GI tract, and in a sense, it's a chronic problem that this is the first time that it's shown up. So those kinds of things are difficult to understand. But one thing to consider is anybody else in their field, anybody else with them, are they sick? Because if a bunch of people are sick, it's much more likely to be an infectious problem. All right. So. I've discussed nervines and nourishing nerve tonics uh, previously. If somebody's having diarrhea because they're upset, I would do a combination of things, but two of my favorite herbs for this, or yes, let me eat one of my favorite herbs for this. One of my favorite herbs for stress-induced diarrhea is chamomile. Yes, that chamomile, that very common chamomile that lots of people use is really helpful here. I think the tea works better if you can use it, but in your first aid bag, you can also make chamomile tincture. Uh, I tincture it one to four, 50 percent, one to four, 50 percent dried chamomile flower heads. Uh, is a really, it does make a good tincture, but the tea is even more relaxing. So stress-induced diarrhea, number one herb I would suggest is chamomile. Uh, the second herb that I would suggest would be catnip. The reason for this is chamomile and catnip are relaxing plants, and they're also guts, uh, they're gut specific plants. So uh, you can put them together, chamomile and catnip, diarrhea with nerves. So, but there are any nervines, you can use skullcap, you can use passionflower, you can use damiana, you can use hops, you can use any of the nervine plants for this but I'm saying that chamomile and catnip are specific for this problem. I guess while I'm at it, let me add the one other plant that I consider a specific, once again as a tea better, but a tincture works. Uh, by the way, with catnip, Nepeta cataria, once again, tea better, but the tincture works. Uh, is is uh, Philopendula almaria, otherwise known as meadowsweet. So meadowsweet, it's not really so much a relaxing plant, but it just, I think, well maybe it is, it just feels good to folks. So meadowsweet is a gut anti-inflammatory. Meadowsweet is a gut anti it reduces inflammation. But, but I don't, I've never heard of it as a specific nervine to the GI tract, but it tastes pretty good. It's well tolerated, and you just have a great tea combination here. Chamomile, meadowsweet, and catnip. And also you can combine those as tinctures or glycerins if, uh, if you're making glycerins. All right, on to the next categories. So as we've discussed in other uh, segments, if it's an infectious organism, if there's no vomiting, all of these are no vomiting. Once there's vomiting, we'll talk a little bit about how to quell the vomiting, but if, they don't, if they're vomiting, 
you can't give them anything internally, right? They're going to puke. Anything internally will make people who are sensitive at this point vomit. So if it's infectious, if it's a giardia or a protozoa, well, giardia is a protozoa or a shigella, bacteria, uh, the first thing to do is activated charcoal. So the reason for it is to try to get the organisms out of there, the pathogens, but also suck up the toxins that they release as they eat food in your GI tract. So activated charcoal is one of the first things to give anybody. Now here's an important thing to know about activated charcoal in these problems, is that you don't want to give activated charcoal and teas and tinctures other medicines at the same time because activated charcoal will absorb them. So we've talked about activated charcoal in some detail. You can look right over here. Activated charcoal button. <laughs> it's not really over here. John is going to have fun with the cameras here. Uh, as activated charcoal um, and learn about it. But if you're going to give them, let's say you're going to give them some of these other herbs, like the disinfecting herbs or the nervine herbs. Well, you're not nervine, so nervine herbs. Any medicines that you're going to give them, um, what you want to do is not give them alongside the activated charcoal because it will absorb them and decrease the activated charcoal's efficiency later and decrease the efficiency of the herbs. So what I suggest is giving 20 minutes in between time. So if you're going to give somebody, uh, let's say, a gut antispasmodic like wild yam to reduce the spasms, uh, give the wild yam tincture and then wait 20 minutes and then give the activated charcoal. So I don't have any science behind this. I just wait 20 minutes because it seems like it works. So, but don't give them simultaneously. Don't say, here's some activated charcoal and here's some wild yam. You know, absorb some of the uh, positive aspects of it. So I hope that makes sense. I give a 20 minute lag time in between. I haven't seen anything, by the way, so I'm not really sure if there's some technical, re uh, anybody, there might be somewhere what really the difference is. It really has to do with how long, the, how quickly the medicine gets absorbed rather than sitting in your mouth or stomach, right? Because once it's absorbed in your bloodstream, activated charcoal doesn't touch it. So activated charcoal, partly it's going to be done on body weight, but if you think that it's an infectious organism that it can reach, so it's not going to reach a virus. So if you have like a, a, a Norwalk virus, you have one of the viruses that create gastric disturbance, you have one of the gastroenteritis, the viral gastroenteritis, which are very common in the United States. Uh, activated charcoal, nada, nothing, because the virus is not in the lumen. There's no place for the activated charcoal to interact with the virus. So, but it's not always easy to tell if that's what it is. Since activated charcoal is fairly safe, you can, if you're not sure, I would say err on the side of giving activated charcoal. I would suggest one to two teaspoons. So you think you have Giardia, you think you have Shigella, you think you have Entamoeba, any of these kinds of things, I would suggest one to two teaspoons of activated charcoal in, a, in as much water as necessary, usually about a half a cup of water. Remember, activated charcoal is particularly bad, by the way, with, nausea, with vomiting um, because it's just, it's, I don't know, it's just very, a lot of powder in there or something. So, uh, take one to two teaspoons of activated charcoal, stir it in water until it's, uh, until it's a slurry. It's actually going to be, you don't want it very thick. Like when we talked about putting it on a pad, it's thick. For this, you want it to be pretty thin and just drink it down. Remember some of the side effects is your teeth and tongue are black if people are looking at it, you that way. And that your uh, poop, your next bowel movements are going to also come out black from the activated charcoal whenever it works its way through your body. So. Um, one to two teaspoons initially, and maybe the first day, do that two or three times. One to two teaspoons in as much water as to make it drinkable. Maybe a half glass to a glass of water, two to three times the first day. So you're getting, you know, three to six teaspoons of activated charcoal. It seems like a lot, um, but that's how I tend to play it safe when I do first aid situations. The next day, uh, maybe one teaspoon, so the same amount, but just twice that day, you know. If you want, though, just reduce it. You can also take capsules. Take four to six capsules per time. And that is less. I just, it's just hard to take that many capsules. So take a couple of capsules uh, a few times a day as necessary. And do this for at least three days. 
right? Get activated charcoal in whatever proportion for about three days. So, yes, one, one teaspoon is probably safe. Two teaspoons is making it a little bit stronger. A couple of times the first day, one teaspoon, twice a day the second day, and then, you know, less the third day, maybe half a teaspoon twice a day, uh, unless the problem is already gone. So that's the activated charcoal. I use a lot of it. I, it just seems to work extraordinarily well, and it's really inexpensive in the way that when you buy it in bulk, as I've talked about previously. So that's the activated charcoal part. The next are the antimicrobials, the things that kill things in our gut. Uh, there's a number of things that kill things in our gut, uh, but I want to mention a few specific. One of them, another tip of the hat to Michael Moore, is a plant called Chaparro amargosa. I'm going to spell it on the board because people confuse it with chaparral. It sounds a little chaparral-y because it's also a Spanish name, but it's Chaparro amargosa. You can see MR here means bitter. This stuff is cruelly bitter. And the genus is either Castella or Holacantha. There's a few species of it. By the way, it's a Cimarubaceae, which if, if you know about Cimarubaceae, it's interesting. Cimaru, uh, Cimaru, I'm going to have to cross that out and write that again. Cimarubaceae. Right there. Uh, the only tree up here, by the way, anywhere around here, it, that's the Cimarubaceae, is the tree of heaven, or Alanthus altissima. Uh, but the Cimarubaceae is famous for killing stuff. There's a lot of uh, plants that kill parasites that are in the Cimarubaceae, including the tree of heaven, uh, Alanthus altissima. So Chaparro amargosa. I suggest I use it in tincture form. The problem with chaparro is just don't gather it. It's one of those plants that it's uncommon in the United States. If you go into Mexico, there are parts where it's gatherable. The problem with going into Mexico is it's actually not easy to bring plants back into the United States. So that's a whole other complication. Um, so I don't know how you're going to get it ethically wildcrafted. Uh, because around here, most of the stands of Chaparro, it's a, it's a southwestern plant. It just barely makes it over the border from Mexico uh, into the United States, into Arizona and California. So, but that's my favorite one. Um, sometimes people who do go to Mexico bring it back, and uh, you can get it from them. I use it as a tincture. It could either be a fresh or a dry tincture, and it's really helpful if you have infection infectious diarrhea. It is really nasty taste. It's just very, very bitter, as MR in Amargosa suggests. And I would suggest something to try to kill a parasite in you, something like maybe, um, the reason I'm thinking about it is I change it with each person and each body type, but with other plants, somewhere between a half dropperful to two dropperfuls, probably about four times the first day that you have it. Somewhere between a half dropper full to two dropper fulls, four or five times the first day. So you're taking large amounts of chaparro initially. So not chaparral, chaparro as in chaparro amargosa, the first day. The second day and the third day maybe something like one dropper full three times a day. And after that maybe half dropper full three times a day until it helps with the problem. So chaparro amargosa is a specific for gut infectious organisms, and it's one of the ones that I use a lot. Um, and once again, so to put that a little bit differently, a bunch frequently initially, uh, not quite as much, uh, not quite as frequently after that, and then less, m less much, and less frequently. A lot, a medium, smaller amounts, but take it regularly. Keep taking it. Whatever amount you take, don't just take it once. Take it enough times to just kind of annoy the heck out of the microorganisms in your gut so that they die, right? So not just once, but stronger amounts regularly to see if, how, much, how much of these different bacterias or protozoas that you can kill. So I hope it makes sense. That's, by the way, how to do a lot of these. A lot frequently, a little less, not quite as frequently, uh, not quite as much, not quite as frequently in that order. So you don't have to think about four hours, five hours, two dropperfuls, but 
So I, I probably have said this enough times. So the first one is Chaparro amargosa. Um, uh, the next is garlic. So as much garlic as you can get in you. Now you're going to be garlic breathy, so you're going to be poopy and garlic breathy while doing this. But one of the easiest ways is just eat the garlic. But if you have an upset stomach, eating garlic can be very rough. You can make garlic tea, which is you just take a garlic clove and just crush it, you know, with a spoon or whatever you crush it with, and just add hot water and drink that right away. So you can make garlic tea. Uh, you probably, I don't know about, I don't know about this frying the garlic in food for this. If the garlic is raw, you can put it in your food though as well. So you can have a peanut butter, a peanut butter, peanut butter is usually not very good by the way for diarrhea. So I just, I'm saying peanut butter uh, because in my mind, peanut butter is hard to digest. Uh, peanut butter has good qualities, but not easy to digest and not good at all for diarrhea. So you can have, eat garlic in whatever form you can get it in you and hide it in whatever form. So another way to take garlic is you can put it in honey and take garlic honey, uh, but you don't want the garlic very well cooked. You don't want it fried here. So aside from garlic, uh, another one to try is yarrow. So just drink really strong yarrow tea or take strong amounts of yarrow tincture. With all of these, limit how long you take them. Maybe give like maybe two weeks maximum because they're pretty strong. These are all, these are all strong on the body. I don't know if they do any direct, well garlic of course is safe, so forget garlic, but just so far the chaparro amargosa and yarrow uh, are useful, but you don't want to continually take large amounts of them. I want to mention some other plants that I haven't used much that also might be helpful that uh, other literature covers better than me. That includes the sage brushes, the genus Artemisia, black walnut, the genus Juglans, um, uh, and those, mostly those two, so Artemisias and Juglans, uh, other things that are used too, once again, without quite as much, uh, without very little use, are pumpkin seeds. Uh, pumpkin seeds have a specific antiparasitical action, and it shows up in literature over and over again, but I don't have experience. So for those three, I would suggest uh, seeking information outside and trying to figure out what to use to kill these parasites. The one I've used most steadily, though, is Chaparro amargosa, which I gathered when I found it. I found enough of it to gather for a while, so I keep using it off that amount. And then I also, I, I definitely have used garlic and yarrow as well. Oh, I didn't mention, and chaparral. I haven't used chaparral as an antiparasitical, but I've considered it, and it's something that I would like to research further and something that you can too. So those are the antiparasiticals. Uh, once again, Depending on the immune system, you might want to add some echinacea into the whole mix to make sure the person's immune system stays up to snuff. By the way, these right now are for infectious diarrhea, not stress-induced or otherwise. The next thing I want to talk about is for the spasms and cramps that often accompany digestive disorders and often accompany diarrhea. So frequently, when people have diarrhea, they are down like this and crampy, uh, and as I've mentioned, that's spastic peristaltic cramping. Can you say that? Spastic peristaltic cramping, otherwise known as spasms or cramps. What's happening is they're having uh, uncoordinated peristaltic. Peristalti peristalsis is the motion of your intestines pushing stuff through. They're having uncoordinated peristaltic movement and that creates a lot of pain. It creates basically these cramps. So there's other organs like gallbladder spasms and uterine spasms, menstrual pains. They're all different kinds of smooth muscle spasms or cramps. And right now though, I want to speak specifically about GI cramps or intestinal cramps. I mentioned it a little bit previously, but I want to mention it now more thoroughly, and that's wild yam. So wild yam uh, is Wild yam is native uh, to the southeast. Basically, start, when you start getting into Virginia, going all the way into Georgia, and a little bit westward, you find wild yam. The genus of it is Dioscorea. So this is not sweet potatoes. Right? These are not the, the things called yams, which are sweet potatoes in the supermarket. This is the plant called wild yam. Uh, it's the rhizome that's used. And I've used it fresh, and I think the drive would probably work well, but I've always made the fresh rhizome tincture 
uh, 1 to 2, 95%. And I've used two species, Dioscorea quaternata and Dioscorea velosa. They're pretty much indistinguishable if you're looking at them. I'm, well, sometimes they're distinguishable, and sometimes they're hard to distinguish. Uh, I would learn to identify those two. There's other species of Dioscorea out there, but the two species I use again, are they're both called wild yam, is Dioscorea velosa and Dioscorea, Dioscorea quaternata. Tincture those, and they are the best gut antispasmodics. So for this painful spasms that accompany it, that's what I suggest. So remember, as long as there's no vomiting, uh, these actually don't taste particularly bad. Once with vomiting, everything changes. Is using the wild yam. Start with one drop. So everything else, like with these anti-infectious herbs, I don't try one drop. I just give enough to try to kill the organism. But wild yam, you're trying to quell a spasm, and sometimes one drop will let you know if it works. And then the amount used is something about half dropper full, and you just keep raising it half dropper fulls. So half dropper fulls until the spasms stop. If the spasms don't stop, I'm going to talk about other antispasmodics. But personal experience is that wild yam is one of the best gut antispasmodics. But for food poisoning, for these bacterial infections, et There's also a formulation that will be on the web called neutralizing cordial. And sometimes the neutralizing cordial, uh, which helps absorb excess stomach acids, but actually sometimes it works as an antispasmodic as well. So neutralizing cordial is in sugar. Uh, which shouldn't be a problem here unless there, the person does have uh, hyperglycemia or some kind of diabetes. Diabetes. So I've just said it, and I just want to talk about it right now. If the person is diabetic and they have diarrhea, everything changes. If the person has diabetes, type 1 diabetes, bad type 2 diabetes, and they have diarrhea or diarrhea with vomiting, everything changes because it's going to change the amount of insulin. It's going to work against the normal amount of their blood volume. And now, the amount of insulin released, the amount of sugar in their blood, it all changes dramatically. I'm saying this from personal experience, having not asked people about diabetes who had diarrhea, who got, much, uh, who got, qu who got sicker much faster. I had no idea what was happening. And what they were doing was going into diabetic shock because they weren't able to keep the normal amounts of insulin in their body. And also, all the food changes, right, because you're not absorbing food anymore. So all of a sudden, this whole balance for somebody who's diabetic with food and sugar and insulin, it's all over the place. So I haven't said it. I'm saying it now. Ask. Ask if they're diabetic. And if they're diabetic, you might have to take special precautions pretty fast to make sure that they don't go into shock. So I hope that makes sense. Ask about diabetes. Really, it's been some painful experiences for them and for me. Uh, not considering it at different times. But you learn over time, um, and the people did okay, but I, uh, it's just, you know, people don't always offer information. So back to antispasmodics. Now, I was saying all this because a neutralizing cordial actually is probably one of the few medicines that tastes good because it has a lot of sugar in it, and it's something as an antispasmodic will work. Valerian uh, can work as an antispasmodic, and valerian is nice because it also just makes people care less about their pain. Silk tassel is useful, so I find silk tassel, garia, more specific for menstrual cramps, but if the, uh, if the wild yam doesn't work, silk tassel is definitely worth it to see if you can quell those gastric spasms. Cramp bark and black haw, cramp bark, viburnum opulus, black haw, viburnum prunifolium are also useful. They're also, by the way, very safe. Those you can really just play with the dosage and go pretty high. The only time not to use any of these, antispasmodics are contraindicated in pregnancy. Another consideration is if a woman's breastfeeding. If she's breastfeeding and has diarrhea, it will alter, potentially alter her milk because it's going to alter her blood. It's going to alter her internal fluids. So it's a consideration there how diarrhea will affect a breastfeeding child. That's just another consideration. But I want to come back to bre uh, pregnancy. With pregnancy, um, diarrhea itself is a problem, right, because you're losing fluids. So diarrhea is a problem in pregnancy. But more so at the moment, antispasmodics are problematic in pregnancy as they can alter contractions of the uterus. Even though they're supposed to stop contractions, they just they alter contractions at times. 
So I'm not going to go into a long detailed aspect of this, but if somebody's pregnant, consider not giving antispasmodics until you know what you're doing, right? Until you work with a qualified person, a midwife, a doula, a birthing assistant, just somebody who really knows what they're talking about here. So that's about these herbs and pregnancy. And the last one is marijuana. I would say one place where marijuana or cannabis works for people who don't get all freaked out and paranoid is as an antispasmodic uh, for diarrhea. So, I, you know, as said previously, lots of people use it for lots of reasons, but I would say specifically here I've seen it help people's uh, spastic cramping with this. Of course, if they have, you know, I haven't said this. If people have never used marijuana, I would never suggest it to them. It's too strong a medicine. I'm not really interested in getting people smoking. Um, and so that's just a consideration. I, by the way, rarely suggest it anyway. I've just, so I've done a whole thing on marijuana, but people will sometimes ask, you know, I smoke pot. What do you think about smoking pot with my diarrhea? And I would say, do you, how do you feel after you smoke? And they go, well, actually, I feel generally pretty good. Uh, and then I'll say, well, it seems like a reasonable alternative. So that's it. That's marijuana and this. Uh, something you might want to consider in all of these medicines, that was antispasmodics. It's just flavoring agents. A lot of, you can add flavor to many of these tinctures and teas, and actually these flavoring agents are often pretty good in themselves. So some, some considerations uh, when giving these antispasmodics or even the antiparasiticals, which are pretty nasty flavored always, uh, you can add, I'm just going to name some plants that you can tincture up or put in teas. I, there's two tinctures that I carry for flavor that have medicinal uses too, and they're cardamom tincture, which is just nice. Most people like cardamom. So even if I'm giving echinacea tincture and I want it to taste better, I can add a couple of drops of cardamom. So cardamom tincture or cardamom tea and cinnamon. So there's many plants that you can tincture and taste good. Two of the ones that I use regularly are cinnamon tincture, because cinnamon tincture has other uses, and cardamom tincture. And so you can put those in the other formulas to make them taste better, because they have an upset stomach. So anything that improves flavor can be helpful here. Uh, other plants that you know, taste good would be ginger, and ginger covers a few grounds. Ginger is also anti-inflammatory and relaxing for the GI system. So ginger for flavoring and for its medicinal attributes as an anti-inflammatory. Fennel, fennel also is a relaxing gut aid. So fennel makes a good tincture. Fennel makes a good tea. It is a good flavoring agent, and fennel is also relaxing to the gut. Relaxing just kind of means gently antispasmodic and anise. So those are all good options, anise seeds, to put into your formulas. Mm -hmm.